in examination of it, though the patient is a normal voluntary one, if, if you have a patient, the first step is as soon as the patient enters your chamber, you should see the gait of the patient, how he is walking. How he is walking. You have to inspect from front and from back, starting from top to bottom. Now, if you are seeing from the back, you should see the level of the shoulder, level of the shoulder, then you see whether there is any deviation or curvature of the spine, then level of the posture superior iliac spine, and of course, wasting in the gluteal muscles, movement at the hip, position of the knee and ankle. Sometimes you may have lower, one of the side had lower down level, lower level of shoulder. You may have a scoliosis with convection towards one side. You may have the oblique pelvis or pelvic obliquity. You may have wasting of the gluteal muscle, less move, movement at the hip joint. Sometimes there may be persistent flexion of the knee joint or sometimes there may be in the ankle, you may get a persistent equinus deformity, inversion or eversion like that. These are a few places, few points to see on gait. Similarly, if you are assessing from the front, you have to see the level of ASIS, the vertical dipping of the pelvis, whether comparable or not, movement at the hip, knee and ankle. As well as, you have to see the rate and rhythm of the gait rate and rhythm of walking. And of course, you must say, finally, lastly, but not the least, the stance phase and the swing phase of both for right side and left side. Because there are in some pathology, I have just explained, there will stance phase may be increased like that. Of course, you have to see the deviation of a trunk toward one side or other side. I mean, on the side of the stance phase, limb with the stance phase and swing phase, and deviation of a trunk to the same side or opposite side of the stance phase limb. So this is in broadly the assessment of walking, of walking, which is one of the important functions for it. Other I have said the sitting. Sitting we basically use cross leg sitting, squatting and cross leg sitting. So this is this is the squatting. You can see that the squatting requires near normal or almost complete flexion at hip and knee joint. Whenever there is any pathology of the hip and knee joint, there may be, squatting may not be possible or may be possible with difficulty depending upon the case. Next is quality. The other is cross leg sitting. This is also one of the screening tests for range of motion of the hip. The cross leg sitting requires certain degree of flexion abduction and the external rotation of the hip. When one of the, any of this component is dimness, the patient may have difficulty in squatting. Now next is, as I told, the third function after walking and sitting, the third is the standing. On the standing, ask the patient to, see the, see the over, ask the patient to stand straight with both the feet together. Here you may see, this is assessment of hip on both double limb stands. See the level of shoulder, level of PSIS, glute, level of PSIS, okay, wasting of gluteal muscles, and if he is, if the, it is symmetrical or not, whether trunk is able to the same, same side or opposite trunk to other side, if there is flexion of knee or some deformity and ankle, you must notice that one. This is how he, what is stability and what is symmetry. These two are important. Next, as I said, Next is single limb stance. You ask the patient to stand on a single limb one by one. Let's say, now see he is standing on his left limb. Right, foot, right limb is off the ground. Now is, if you see this, if you mark the posterior superior iliac spine or from anterior you can mark the anterior superior iliac spine. When the left, right, then the left is on stance phase and right foot is off the ground, the right sided Hemipelvis, noted by the PSIS or ASIS, is at the is either at the same level or maybe slightly higher than the other side. This is normal. Now the patient is weight bearing on the left side, 
and so I am testing the abrogation mechanism of the left side, consistent of the left, consistent of the hip joint, liver arm, and the abdominal muscle. That is gluteus medius. Okay. Similarly, you ask the patient. Similarly, you ask the patient to wait bear on the other side. That is right side. Now stands face on the right side, and still the both the pelvis are at the level. Both the ASIS and PSIS are at the same level because the abrogation mechanism on the right side is functional to bring the pelvis to the level. Let's say, let's say there is a weakness of the abrogation mechanism on the right side, either in the hip joint or liver arm or lower, then what will happen is the, the opposite side or this. If there is pathology on the abrogation mechanism on the right side, the left hemipelvis deep down, suggested by the lower level of the PSIS. Okay. This will be lower down. Or sometimes the patient may do a tricky movement that he will deviate the trunk towards this side, the opposite side, the stance limb side, so as to bring the pelvis on the left side up and bring it to appears as if they are at the same level. What he is trying to do is, he is trying to compensate the weakness of the abdominal muscle by shifting the center of gravity to the, towards the side of weight-bearing limb. If it is like that, trunk is able to towards the, the, this right side or trunk is straight but the left ASI is at lower level. In these two conditions, this is a positive Trendenburg test. Here, we are assessing the muscle for right side. Okay. Now, if it is the same level, it is doing down, let's say. The left side of hemipelvis is dipping down on weight bearing on the right side. And it is, the right side is at the same level with the left side. In this case, in this case, the right side is, the left side is sagging down. The mnemonic is sound side sags. Which is sound side here? Sound side is left side or left abdominal mechanism. Sagging is this left is sagging. However, on doing this, they are the same level. That means we are testing here the left side. This is normal. That's why the pelvis are the level. Okay? Do we take one? Do we take one? Okay. Few things that you must understand here is whenever there is weakness or inefficiency of the abdominal mechanism, consistent of the hip joint or fulcrum, liver arm or neck, and power all the or the gluteus medius you have a positive training work test. Cause in the fulcrum like posterior dislocation of hip, portis disease, these are the causes where the fulcrum is a deficient. Liver arm like fraction neck of femur, non united fraction, non united fraction neck of femur or coxa vara. Or the power like gluteus medius weakness. Maybe because of polio, general neuromuscular weakness, or sometimes super gluteal nerve palsy may lead to weakness of the gluteus medius. These also have, will lead to the weakness and positive training work test. There are there is some fallacy like when the hip can maintain the abduction or adduction per se without the use of the abdominal mechanism. Like when there is on subsequent examination, if I found the fixed flexion, sorry, fixed abduction or fixed adduction deformity, or one of the hip is ankylosed or fused. Then the patient can maintain adduction or abduction without the use of this abductor mechanism. In this condition, you are cannot comment or you cannot assess the abductor mechanism and simply you cannot comment on the Trendelenburg test. Okay. Now after that, walking, sitting, standing, <coughs> and finally lying down position. We have to mark certain landmarks before we start with our examination. Okay. This midline, you have a, this has symphysis pubis here. If you roll your finger a little bit laterally, you have another bony prominent, that is pubic tubercle. I will mark the pubic tubercle here. Now from this pubic tubercle, you move your finger a little bit proximal and lateral, along the proximal lateral side. You can roll or cord-like structure beneath your finger, something roll-like thing. 
cord like so that is lingual ligament you follow the lingual ligament and finally you feel for the first bony landmark hard bone mark stop point that is the anterior superior iliac spine similarly you repeat the same procedure on the other side Uh, do you have the other uh, anterior superior iliac spine? Similarly, on the middle joint line, you you palpate the middle joint line or the adductor tubercle here, where adductor muscle is attached. This is the adductor tubercle here. Similarly, from this side, this one. that is the middle joint line. You make a point on the middle joint line, and other is. You palpate the middle malus. You see, for the most prominent part of middle malus, usually it is posterior, inferior one. So this is the middle malus. Similarly here. Next is on the left side of femur. You 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 palpate for bony prominence. You will palpate a trochanteric area. And you palpate for the most prominent part of trochanteric area, which is usually the posterior superior one. That is a you palpate the most prominent part of the you palpate the most prominent part of yeah this is the femur and you palpate this is here the most prominent part of greater trochanter here and similarly on the other side these are a few landmarks that we should mark before starting with the examination so it is here. Now, as soon as the patient, you have finished with your gait, cross leg sitting, squatting, and trained walk test, trained Dillon walk test, ask the patient to lie down on a couch. Before starting with the exam, there are a few prerequisites. Out of the end of the important one is the patient should be a calm and cooperative patient. Other is the firm bed. And third is adequate exposure of course from the jeffy sternum to all the way down except the prior part and for the good source uh, adequate light good light okay. first we describe the attitude of the patient the attitude of the patient simply means the position attained by the patient and both the lower limbs that is hip knee and ankle as well as the rotational alignment this is the attitude so if I will describe for this patient, I can describe as my patient is lying comfortably on an examination couch with both the upper limb by the side of the trunk, side of the chest. Next is, both the both of side, next is you describe the position of the hip, knee and ankle. Or you say the bilateral hip, knee and ankle as well as the trunk. If you see this, normally everybody will have a lumbar lordosis. If you lie down, a patient lying down, there is some space between the back of the back and the examination couch, except in an obese patient, which is where you may not appreciate. Okay. You first comment on the lumbar lordosis. Don't say there is lumbar lordosis. Everybody will have a lumbar lordosis. We are con in interested on whether it is exaggerated or not. You try to see from through and through and insulate your hand. If you can see through and through, then of course the lumbar lordosis is exaggerated, which is a compensatory mechanism for a fixed flexion deformity of hip. So if you have that, you mention there is exaggerated lumbar lordosis. If not, there is no exaggerated lumbar lordosis you have to mention. So after the exaggeration of lumbar lordosis, then you come to the hip, knee and ankle. Bilateral hip and knee are extended position. Ankle in neutral position means neither plant flex nor rush flex. Then the apparent length or apparent, apparent length of the lower limb. You may comment on whether there is apparent lengthening or shortening. If there is apparent lengthening, you mention there is apparent lengthening of right lower limb as evidenced by the distal level of heel, middle malus, and potla. That shows there is apparent lengthening. Sometimes you may have apparent shortening also. The next, the rotational alignment. 
Here you can see both the patella are a little bit external rotated. It is facing outward, which is a natural one, normal. Okay, is normal. So <coughs> you can say both the bilateral hip, knee, and ankle are hip and knee are in the external position, ankle in neutral position. Then the rotation alignment is symmetrical. Next, you have to mention about the wasting of apparent wasting of thigh and calf muscle. If it's present, you mention whether apparent wasting of thigh or apparent wasting of calf muscle like that. If not, you don't have to mention. If it's not yet, you can also mention there is no apparent, apparent wasting of thigh and calf muscle like that. So this is how you describe an attitude. After attitude, we go for the inspection. On inspection, you inspect all the areas anterior, lateral, and posture of the hip as well as all lower limb. First, start with the skin conditions. You must say there is no abnormal scar mark, sinuses, venous prominence, prominences, swellings, and bulgings in and around the hip joint because we are concerned with the example of hip. Okay. So, this is the first statement. Next, if you have not mentioned about the exaggerated lumbar lordosis in the attitude, you can mention now only also. You can comment on the exaggerated of lumbar lordosis, whether present or not, on the during the inspection also. Or you can mention in the before and during attitude only. Okay. So once you have to say there is no ML mass, no sinus, scar mark, anything like that, from anterior posture and lateral. Be specific to maintain mention about there is no abnormal mass or swelling in the gluteal region posture because that is a significant that you must mention as well. We have to see the eye like fossa, scapular triangle or femoral triangle, lateral aspect of the thigh, thigh and posture gluteal region. After that, once you are over with the lumbar lordosis, next is you inspect the level of the anterior superior alveolar spine. If one of them is appears to be higher, you say it is right side anterior superior alveolar spine appears to be higher, or lower, it's, you mention it appears to be at lower levels. It is the word is appears to be, because this is your inspection. You can just inspect, but not from the side. Of course, from the side. Of course, from the foot end, from this side. You can see whether both are at the same level or not. If it is like that, you just comment. Okay. So after the ASIS, then. You inspect the inguinal area for any abnormal bulgings, pulsations, or swellings. Of course, the important one is you compare the inguinal crease with the bore side, whether there are there is obliteration of the obliteration of the inguinal fold, or there is asymmetry of the fold, or sometimes there may be additional fold, especially in children with DD, development dysplasia of DDS. Next, on inspection from the latter side, you inspect the trochantic area are the most prominent part of the trochantic area. It is you see for label whether whether one of the trochanter is at higher level or lower level. I mean proximal or distal. Sometimes in an obese patient uh, you may be unable to comment on that. That is not a problem. If you are able to comment, you can comment. If not, you can. Proximal to that, there is sometimes you may have a supra trochantic hollowness. You compare the supra hollowness. If present, compare right side to left side. If not, you need not to comment. The next is you inspect from the back, which is very much important. Okay. Inspection from the back, <coughs> you keep the symmetrical position, and you see for the dimple, this this depression, this and this. This is basically that it represents the dimple of venous or corresponding to posterior superior alex spine. Posture should be like spine. You see the level of both this. Sometimes there may be swelling or abnormal bulging over here. Then compare the gluteal folds, whether they are symmetrical or not. And specifically mention about whether there is any globular swelling or globular mass in the corner of the gluteal region or not. Okay. And next, next is compare the gluteal crease. Whether there is asymmetry is there or additional, additional crease is there, you compare and mention on inspection also. See that was it.